Hello, everyone. That's a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, welcome here tonight. Um, we're so glad to have you here. And um, I just had a couple things I wanted to talk to you to about tonight before we got started. Brooke, could you throw that one picture up on the screen for me? So this was our class we had Saturday. And um, Leanne, the daughter of the Cartiers here, was in attendance. We had 20 students that we taught the Constitution to. Actually, we had 40 people that were in attendance. It was kind of a rigorous program. Uh, it was so rigorous that I couldn't get up to be here at 8 o'clock for it. But uh, this was the Constitution Boot Camp. I think it was number 48. And uh, 40 people participated in it, and 20 of them were students. And it was a great thing to see. And what just really was so kind of cool about it was Jill, who is our operations manager, told me that none of them wanted to leave when it was over. Five hours into it, they all wanted to stay. They all wanted to ask questions. They were enthralled in it. And it was a great thing. So um, we bribed them to come. Um, we gave them all a $25 GameStop gift card. But, you know, I guess what's more important, the bribe or the fact that they all kind of know something about the Constitution now. So it's our goal to have one of these boot camps every semester, as long as we can get 20 kids or so to come. And so if you've got grandkids, if you've got kids, um, people you think that would benefit from it, um, tell them to watch for our spring semester because we're going to offer another one, which will be a lot of fun. So we've got some great classes coming up. Um, I think 20 people today signed up for the cold case mystery Thursday night, the Bricka murders with uh, our friend uh, JT Townsend. Bill Roll tells me the Bricka house is for sale in Western Hills. So um, I'm not going to go out and I don't think buy it or anything. But how many of you have ever heard the story about the Brickas? It's, it's a great story. If you haven't heard it, please come or watch online. And hello to everybody online. Welcome here tonight. And uh, we're glad to have you. So that's Thursday night. And then the following Tuesday, we're going to have a little session called How to Be an Activist. For any of you who have ever wanted to get involved in your community, to do things, um, get involved in politics, your school board, your apartment complex, like Betty's a big president of her, uh, her condo association. Whoever, whoever has wanted to do that, come Tuesday night. We've got four great people who are going to talk to you. One's name is Kim Grant. She's a conservative school board um, member from King's School Board. And it's, she'll tell an incredible story about being heckled about being, uh, having just being besieged by people because the concept of being a conservative and being on a school board, the two just do not go at all. And I think she'll tell you about some of the questions that are now being asked of potential school board members of whether they belong to any anti-tax groups. And that's a question that the school boards are actually asking to decide if you're good enough to be on the school board. Those are the odds you're facing. She'll tell that story. Also coming Tuesday night will be Jeff Capel, who single-handedly stopped the taxpayers from having to support all of FC Cincinnati, whether you like them or not. He'll tell you how he did it and how he kept your investment to only 30 million instead of probably 200 million. It's just money, right? Um, and then we'll also hear from a guy named Matt Wallert, who's a really interesting guy. He's the guy that led the petition uh, initiative for the sales tax, the recent sales tax increase in Hamilton County. He'll talk to you about what it took to get that done, and it's an incredible story. And then the fourth person who will be coming and talking to us that night will be, let's see, Ed Bell, who's probably run more kind of door-to-door -door campaigns than anybody I ever know, and he'll be joining us from Colorado. Uh, via Skype and if you've got a candidate you're trying to support but you're nervous you don't like going you don't like going and knocking on somebody's door or anything like that Ed will kind of tell you how to make that easy and kind of almost make it fun so that's Tuesday night that'll be fun and then Ken um, Ken in my a class that we've been talking about all semester is the visit to the Wiedemann Brewery on October 4th that's a week from Thursday night We've only got, I think it's 40 people. We need to see if we can get that increase to 50. We've already got 32 signed up. So if you're thinking about going to the Weedman Brewery a week from Thursday night for a little tasting, um, they're going to give us a tour and everything. And if you want to taste the beer, I think it's $10. 
uh, sign up, please, because those are going fast. Um, so what we're going to do tonight is we are going to give away one of the Think and Grow Rich books. How many of you were like me when you were younger, when you read, how many of you read this book like when you were like in your 20s or eight? How, did any of you read it? It's been a long time. I can't wait. I can't wait to get back into it. I'm so happy you guys would come tonight. Thank you so much. So, Betty, let's go ahead and get your tickets out. We'll draw a number. How about number 874? Maggie. Let's give Maggie a round of applause. Congrat congratulations. Way to go. And then um, I'm going to ask our board member, Ken, who put this program together, to come up and introduce our guests. Let's give Ken a round of applause. Oh, yeah, let me introduce a couple of friends. We've got Jay and Brooke back there producing tonight. Bill Roll, our treasurer, and Betty, our community relations manager. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you for coming tonight. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, my name is Ken Bowman, and um, you know how it is when you decide you're going to read a book? Anybody? You decide I want to read that book because it might change my life, and books do change lives. This book has probably been responsible for changing more lives since it was it first introduced or written after 25 years of research in 1937. That's how long it's been around. So I read the book and put it on the shelf for about 20 years and decided it's time for me to reread the book. And to the great law of the universe, I put it out there and I said, well, I'm, I'm gonna read this book. And somebody said, well, I know these guys that are offering this class on this book. And I said, well, sign me up. I'm gonna go to a class. So I, I signed up for the class, and um, fortunately, one of my good friends, Al Lindemann, was teaching the class. Uh, we belong to a father's group at St. James. We meet every Friday morning at 6.03 a.m. to learn how to be better fathers, better Christian men, and better husbands. I've been going for 30 years because I'm, I'm a slow learner. But anyway, Tim Burgess and Al Lindemann are going to speak tonight. Uh, Tim has been studying the success principles for over 20 years. His primary focus has been on the areas of dynamic thinking, effective communication, personality traits, and entrepreneurial mindsets. After several years of studying this material, over 20, I believe, he decided to apply it to the real estate profession. The proof that he had been studying, what he, what he had been studying works, proved out in the first uh, 17 listings he achieved in his first full month in the real estate business. That's one every other day. And that was December of 1999, closings that he secured his first full year. And his real estate success only improved from there. So after several years of success in selling real estate, he turned his attention to helping other real estate agents achieve greater success through the knowledge, experience, and skills that he developed. Now, one footnote you may find interesting about Tim is he's an eighth grade dropout. He didn't even go to high school. Uh, Al Endeman, on the other hand, traveled a more traditional route. He did graduate from high school and college and then moved into corporate America for over 30 years. Uh, during those 30 years, he worked uh, for a few big corporations, Honeywell, ADT, uh, Security, as well as a few smaller companies. So what really changed Al's life was when he transitioned from sales to management, and that transition really opened his eyes to how little he knew about business and people and life. It started him on a 20-year journey of studying leadership, organizational development, sales, and sales development effective communication topics covering the seven habits in emotional intelligence. Through his studies out, helped the company he worked for open new offices in new cities that significantly increased their revenue and profits. And after 30 years in corporate America, Al felt it was time to follow his true passion. He left the corporate world to start a training and mentoring business with the help of his friend, Tim Burgess. So please give a warm, empower you. Welcome to Tim Burgess and Al Lindemann. Al's the guy in the sweater, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, everybody. How are you today? I tell you, I was speaking for Tim and I, it is truly a blessing for the two of us to be here with you to talk about a book that has truly changed both of our lives. Uh, I'll let Tim tell his story here in a second, but uh, for me, the book is the reason that I know Tim. Mm -hmm. Now, I bought this book back in the 1990s. When I, Ken mentioned, when I got into management back in the 1990s, I learned within an hour 
of being in the job as a manager that I wasn't prepared to be a manager. It took me a whole hour to figure it out. Now, I wasn't the guy that was going to fail, right? So I had to do something about it. And so what I did is I started to invest in myself. And I started reading books. I became a sponge. I couldn't get enough. I couldn't read enough. I couldn't go to enough trainings. But there was one book that was my Achilles heel. It was a book called Think and Grow Rich. I had heard the book. I knew the book was a great book. I bought the book. I tried to read the book multiple times over 50 years. I get through the first four chapters. I put it on the shelf because it just wore me out. That's the truth. Many times, four or five times over 15 years, I tried to read it. Is that the same way? It is. Absolutely. It's just, it, and the reason is I tried to read the book like we were taught to read books, like a novel. And, and it's not a book that's meant to be read like a novel. You've got to take it, you got to sip it, right? It's like a fine wine or uh, cognac, right? I'd sip on it and just little bit by little bit. So in the year 2009, a cousin of mine sent me an email. Some of you may know Dr. Joe Lindemann, Chester, he's a chiropractor. But come to find out that Joe and Tim were also. And Joe sent me an email, say, hey, I got a buck. He's going to do a program on the book, Think and Grow Rich. If you're interested, contact him. Well, it was at a time in my life where change was happening. The winds of change were blowing. And I needed to do something different. And I knew that book had keys to my future. I just didn't know how to get through it. So when I heard Tim was doing a program on the book, Think and Grow Rich, well, I sewed up for the first session. It was a webinar, or it was actually a back in those days. I joined up the first conference call. I liked it enough, said, okay, I'm coming back next week. He did it over about a 14, 15 week period. At the end of the second session, I said to Tim, I said, man, where are you? Where do you live? And he said, well, I live in Fairfield. I said, no way. He said, yeah, okay. And I said, well, I live in White Oak, west side of town, right? And Tim said, we both said, well, let's go grab breakfast. So a week later, he and I are having breakfast at the Bob Evans on Union Center Boulevard. And boom, like that, almost instantaneously, we're friends. And lo and behold, several years later, we're going to become business partners. And to be honest with you, it's the best thing that's happened in my life. This book changed my life, partly because I met Tim, partly because of what it's going to do, what the principles in the book can do for you. We'll talk about that in a little while. Tim. And, and thank you for allowing us to be here, truly. This book has massively changed my life. Um, Dad left at a very young age. I was running around, uh, you know, as a, as a teenager at 11 years old, I was making my own decisions. A teenager at 11 years old. Did you guys catch that? Come on, wake up, man. I, I, go, I go fast, but you can listen faster than I can talk. <clears throat> and I, I answered an ad in February of 1996 to change my life. And it, the ad was just a sales job in the newspaper. And I walk into a room about like this for my interview. Huh? How many of you ever walk into a room like this for your interview at a sales job? No, I walked into a network marketing meeting. Now, I'm not saying anything bad about network marketing, not in it by any stretch of the imagination. It's one of the great avenues that you can create wealth if you choose that avenue. But that's not what I was looking for. But they said something that night that made sense. So I dug a little bit deeper and I had a chance to meet the founder of the company and he told me to get a copy of this book. And he said this, study it every day for the rest of your life. Now at the time I'm 31 years old, I quit school in the eighth grade, I'm going down the wrong road and I'm picking up speed. Probably don't wanna grab one book and read it at all, let alone study the daggone one book for the rest of my life, but I have done so. And, tw and just three and a half years later, when I got into real estate, as Ken mentioned, I increased my income 604% in one year. I had never experienced anything like that. And all I was doing was following very basic, simple principles. Now, some people think that that's, that's how did you do that? It's simple. It's all in the book. And we want to share with you tonight what the books not only can, has done for us, but what can it do for you? How can it help you enhance the quality of your life? And I'm not saying that you don't have a good life, but everybody wants to grow, don't we? And my first mentor said this, you can learn to think and grow rich or don't think and grow broke. It's your choice. So I decided to grab the book and decided to learn to think and grow rich. And that's why we're here tonight, just to help you in any way we can understand the success principles that has helped us so much in our lives. So we're here to talk about a book. Now, mm -hmm. the question was earlier, I got a sense that not too many of you, if anybody's ever read the book. Is that fair? How many of you have heard of the book? Not too many okay. of you, okay? Not even half. 
this is the best book that nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> yeah. Really, it's the best book that nobody's ever heard of. And I'm shocked. <laughs> people have heard of the book Think and Grow Rich. And part of our mission is to fix that. Mm -hmm. We believe so highly in the principles that Napoleon did share with us in the book that we want the world to know about. When, when you do read the book, when you do read the book, the thing you'll find is he says he wants this in every school. So we believe mm -hmm. there's power behind the you know what? I, I have to agree with them. You know, I, have to, I, I think everybody here when they have kids and they have kids that went through school, and not that they don't get a good education, but there's parts of their education that are missing. It's about real life. And, and the key is that this book teaches us principles that are all about real life. Okay? So we're going to talk about this book pretty much the rest of the night. But I want to share with you. We know how few people know about Napoleon, how few people know about the book. I want to just give you a little history about what this is all about. So Napoleon Hill is a really interesting guy. He was born in 1883. He was in a one-room cottage in rural Virginia. Tells you a little bit about his upbringing, right? Didn't have a lot of money. Now, this guy has, I mean, if you ever read his bio, this guy did it all. But the thing was really, really unique is that in 1908, he had the opportunity to interview a guy by the name of Andrew Carnegie. Anybody know who Andrew Carnegie is? <laughs> U.S. Steel, right? Richest man in the world around the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. Well, Napoleon was writing for a small town newspaper magazine in West Virginia. What he did is he wrote an article on a regular basis about interviewing wealthy people, what made him wealthy. So he had the opportunity to go to Andrew Carnegie's office, interviewed Andrew for a couple hours, talked about you know, success and that type of thing. And as Napoleon was ready to pack up his stuff and leave, Andrew said, where are you going? And Napoleon says, well, I'm done with my interview. He said, no, you're not. You're going home with me. We're not even, we just haven't even started yet. So Andrew takes Napoleon home with them. He spent another day, two days, continuing to talk about success principles. When it was all said and done, and Andrew finally had exhausted telling Napoleon about all the things that he had learned in his years of being, you know, just going from a poor man himself to famously well. Andrew posed a question to Napoleon that said, very simply, are you prepared to spend the rest of your life studying what makes successful people successful and then sharing it with the world? And in his mind, when Andrew asked that simple question, Andrew gave, was going to give Napoleon 60 seconds to make up his mind. And Napoleon was sitting there pondering, you know, those 60 seconds could seem like an eternity, couldn't they? Well, it took somewhere around 30, 40 seconds. Napoleon finally looked at Andrew in the eyes and said, yeah, I'll take that on. And Andrew then go, proceeds to tell him, he said, well, if you had taken 20 more seconds, I was going to pull the offer from you. Now, Andrew wasn't going to pay Napoleon a penny to do this. Mm -mm. He said, all I'm going to do is give you the opportunity to get into doors and meet the people that you need to meet but this is on you. This is your job. This is your mission in life. Napoleon took that on. Over the next 20 years, Napoleon goes out and interviews some of the wealthiest, most influential people in the world. I'll share some of those names with you here in a second. In the process of doing all his research, he actually writes a first book. It's called The Laws of Success. Mm -hmm. The Laws of Success was published in 1927, as I believe. That was the first production from the research and the interviews that he was doing. Over the next nine years, he proceeds to then continue to work on it and refine it, and he whittles it down to 13 principles that he writes in the book, Think and Grow Rich, which he published in 1937. So this book is now 80 plus years old. And again, it's still the best book that nobody's ever heard of, mm -hmm. okay? No question. Interesting thing, Napoleon finally passed in 1970. Whoa. Finally passed in 1970. By that point in time, he had written a total of 11 books. So some of them, some amazing pieces of work. Would highly suggest you find a few of them, but start with Think and Grow Rich, because without a doubt, that is the one that's going to change your life. Now, we talk about the book itself. The book was published in 1937. It's got 13 amazing principles. Any one of them could change your life. Now, one of the things that the poll says in the book no one person that he interviewed did or possessed or was skilled in all 13 principles. So the cool thing about that is, is you don't have to learn them all. You just got to do a few of them. There's three or four, but absolutely, if you master them, you'll be honest with you, success is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Just 
just you gotta do the work. Okay? You mm-hmm. gotta put the time in. But the book, the principles, the timeless. It, this book has made more millionaires. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's fact. It is still on Business Week's most sold business books mm-hmm. in history. John Maxwell has it on must read. If you talk to many of the gurus here today, like leadership, personal development gurus, Tony Robbins, and on and on, all of them say that part of their foundation is built upon the principles of making money. Mm-hmm. This book, as I've said, mm-hmm. is the best book you've ever heard. Mm-hmm. Now, a couple of things that are just the who's who. I mean, there's 500 people that Napoleon interviewed during the process. But some of the real go to names Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, William Rigby Jr., Harvey Fires. He even has a list of presidents mm-hmm. Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, on and on and on, Rockefellers. Mm-hmm. This book is the new zoo. Mm-hmm. The stories that are phenomenal, the principles in it are absolutely off the chart. It's life changing. You just take the time to study. Now, I don't have time to use reading a book every day. <laughs> and to be honest with you, this man is going to need me to study this book for this man because the time and the energy that he's vested into these principles. You know, it changed my life. It saved his. Mm-hmm. That's a difference. Yeah. The impact of this book has had in his life, I can never touch if I didn't go through the things that he went through. But it saved his life. Mm-hmm. Therefore, is the reason, the passion that goes up inside of him to be able to tell the story. It's truly a pleasure on my part to be able to be here just to introduce this guy and tell him some of the principles that we're going to go through tonight. I just think it's just a blessing to be able to share the stage with him. Now, a couple of things. When we talk about the story, thinking we're rich. Yeah. What word do you think that is the word that people emphasize the most in that title? Rich. Absolutely. You wouldn't relate that to money, would you? Huh. You know, when you read the book, again, when you read no. the book, it's not about money. No. Now, the book was published in 1937. What was happening back in 1937? Great Depression. Great Depression. Yeah. What was on most people's mind? Mm-hmm. So certainly, he was important to the people that he was writing it for. When he says in the book, it's not about money, it's about a money consciousness. Meaning, it's what you need to do in order to achieve what you want to achieve. So the thing that's really important is not about thinking. The book. Is about teaching us the importance of learning how to think. And that's one of the reasons Napoleon says it's so important to get this in the school. Because I don't like you guys, but I don't like kids, and they're great kids. But the fact is, they came out of school knowing what it's one of those things where they were taught what to think. I don't know if they were always taught how to think. And that's a mm. major, major issue. Mm. That's it. Thank you, sir. Timing is great. Understanding how we think. If I were to ask you, how do we think? Why'd you give me a blank look? You guys okay if we have some fun? I like to have a blast. I'm a big giant goofball. Just having some fun in life, if that's okay. How do we think? Now, the book's called Think and Grow Rich. So if I have an issue understanding how in the world I think, I'm already behind the eight ball, aren't I? I really am. Don't worry, I won't forget you guys over here. No worries, no worries. But I ask a lot of questions, is that okay? So what is success? Being rich, rich, okay. What is success? Family, family, just having one? Relationships, okay, cool. What is success? Being happy, sir? I'll go ahead. You got something in there. <laughs> I know you do. It's in there. Go ahead. Let it out. Being around other people that mean something. Okay, being around other people that mean something. So relationships. Now, would you agree that we didn't hear any wrong answers? Did we hear any wrong answers? 
We didn't hear any wrong answers, did we? But where does it say, what is your version of success? Ah. See, I, the, they did the same thing to me. I was sitting in an audience just like you are, and somebody asked me that question. I did exactly what you did. And then they said, well, Tim, it doesn't say what is your version of success. It says, what is success? I was like, shoot. Okay, the best definition I've ever heard, and I think you'll agree with me, success is nothing more than the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. Progressive, realization, worthy, and ideal. Four, four catch words right there. Progressive means what? In motion, right? Realization means coming into reality, right? Okay, progressive realization, coming into reality, worthy. Something of value, would you agree? Something of value, I ideal. The heck's an ideal? How about an idea that you have fallen in love with? Isn't Empower You a perfect example of the progressive realization of a worthy ideal? One idea, and look what it's turned into. Would you call it success? See, it's not, we all get hung up on the, the amount of money or this or that. That's not, that's not success. Success is the journey where you keep going in the face of adversity. That's success. Does this make sense? Whole different version about when you first looked at that and saw what is success. You're thinking a little different now, aren't you? Isn't that amazing how fast that happens? It truly is. Really, success is about producing results. But not just the results we get in life with money. My first mentor taught me money is the last sign of success you'll ever see. At the time in my life, I went, shoot, can't we turn that around? Can it be first? Because I could use a little more money at the end of the month, you know? But success is about results in all areas of life, spiritual, social, mental, physical, family, and financial. It's not just one. It's all areas of life. So how many of you really want a whole bunch of money and nobody to share it with? What good would it be? But then again, what good is it to have a whole bunch of people to share it with and absolutely no money? So we have to have some balance, would you agree? That's what we're talking about in this book, balance. He's not talking about just all money. Not at all, not in any way, shape, or form. So here's a question, here's another, I'm full of questions, is that okay? You're not gonna hit me, are you? You're in the front row and stuff. Hey, what's up with the front row? You, 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 oh, y'all didn't know we taped money underneath the front seats. Watch, she'll check in a second. Uh, uh huh. Yeah, so here's a question every one of you really should be able to answer. And that question is, what is the primary cause of all of your results? All of the results you get in every area of your life, spiritual, social, mental, physical, family, and financial, what's the primary cause? What is it? Effort, action. I love that, the look going, madam, where is he going with this? I studied reading body language, I shouldn't tell you that. You guys are screaming at me and you're not saying a word. Not a word, not a word. Really, what's the primary cause of all results? Nothing more than that word. Attitude. Think about it. Attitude. Great attitude, how are your results? Always. Results always follow attitude. You ever notice that? I know growing up, they told me a few times you need to get a better attitude, kid. I said, yeah, they were right. And then they took me out to the woodshed and all that stuff. But yeah, it's just part of life, right? But here's another question I have then. What is attitude? I got the same blank look that when I asked, what is success? The same blank look just hit me, Mr. Lindemann. Did you see that? It did. See, if we don't, if we don't know what it is and can't clearly define it, how could we help somebody get a better one? Would you agree? So attitude's really very simple. It's nothing more than your thoughts, your feelings, and your actions. Not just one of them, though. All of them combined. Yeah. And mo what do most people do? They live on the outside of that circle of responsibility, and they play the blame game. I know you guys would never do that. The blame game, right? I used to be in real estate. Are you kidding me? The blame game? The home inspector killed another deal. The mortgage company can't get anything right title company. Gosh darn, man. Are you in real estate? You are. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, you know exactly. What, it's always somebody else's fault. No. Step into that circle of responsibility. Take 100% responsibility for your own thoughts, your own feelings, and your own actions. In other words, 100% responsibility for your own results. Now, did I want to hear that from a guy when I was dead broke, going nowhere in life? No. But was he right? Yeah. 
he was right. He really was. Take 100% responsibility. Wherever you are in life, it doesn't matter. Just take responsibility. But that top one, the thoughts, let's talk about that one for a minute because the book is called Think and Grow Rich, right? So let's talk about thoughts. And you know, for, the, for as long as you can go back in recorded history, all of the great thinkers, philosophers, theologians, capitalists, all of the mega wealthy in any industry, anywhere, all agree that we actually become what we think about. Have you ever heard that? You become what you think about, right? Well, how do we think then? Back to that question, how do we think? If we become what we think about and we don't understand how we think, it's kind of hard to think differently, isn't it? Yeah, and it's real simple. We literally think in pictures. Huh? It's that easy? It's that easy. Your, your eyes, the way your eyes just came at me, went, it can't be that simple. You know, you and the Cincinnati Bearcats on. You're talking to me, man. Without saying a word, you're talking to me. I get it. But we think in pictures. I mean, regardless of what I ask you to think of, if I ask you to think of a boat or an airplane or a hot air balloon, you get an image. Think of your kitchen. Image just popped. Think of your automobile. Think of a commode. But still a picture popped on the screen of your mind, right? Would you agree with that? And if we don't have clarity, then we have confusion. For example, if I were to ask you to think of your house, you have a clear image, right? So there's no confusion. I'm going to give away, can I give away some of your money? Absolutely. I love giving away his money. It's one of my favorite things to do. I'm going to ask you five questions about your house. And for every right answer, I'm going to give you $100. That's an easy 500, but look at it. They'll all be standing in line going, can I be next? Can I be next? Can I be next? No, really, we'll, we'll, give it, we'll, we'll give you $100 for every right answer. You in? You know what your house looks like. There's no confusion, is there? But there's a second part of this. Now she doesn't want to play anymore. Did you notice, did you notice how quickly she was shifted gear? You know, if you do that in your automobile, you leave your transmission in the middle of the street. That's truth, right? The second part is, after I'm done asking you about your house, I'm going to ask you five questions about his. And for every wrong answer, you owe me $1,000. Do you still want to play? No, no, it doesn't sound right. No, the odds are not in your favor, champ. I'm going to back you up here. Don't play. See, now, why don't you want to play? It's because you don't have an image of his house, do you? So you have a lack of clarity in the image that she's holding on the screen of her mind. That lack of clarity instantly causes worry, doubt, fear, and anxiety if we're talking about $5,000, doesn't it? Now, if this were real, man, you could feel the anxiety level just going to a whole new level, right? And it's all because of lack of clarity. So the point is we want to have a clear image of what we're doing, where we're going. We think in pictures. My first mentor told me that. I said, Jesus, oh, Pete, that's too simple. He said, life is simple, Tim. People complicate it. Oh, boy, that's a whole nother seminar for a whole nother day. More on that one later. So we're talking about images on the screen of the mind. And if we don't have clarity, we have confusion, right? What's your mind look like? Oh, boy, you ought to see the looks on your faces now. Do we have the recording of their faces as I ask these questions? <laughs> we do? We don't. Oh, man, I would love, I would love that recording. I really would. <laughs> So as they asked me that question, I thought of the brain. Anybody think of the brain? I thought of the brain, gray matter, wormy looking thing up there, right? The brain and the mind are two totally different things. Two totally different things. So in 1934, this guy named Thurman Fleet, he was very much into the healing arts. And he said, mind is an activity, it's not a thing. And since no one has ever seen the mind, I'll create an image we can work with. And he created that thing right there. Now, first time I looked at that, I thought they had a drunk graphic artist who in school ever drew a stick man with a head that big? I never did until I started, they started explaining it and it made sense. They said, no, we have a mind and a body. We have a conscious and a subconscious. Now, I know there's many other parts of the mind we could get into. Let's not go there. I like simple. Anybody okay with simple? I'm okay with simple. So we have a conscious and a subconscious. In your conscious mind, you can think anything you wish to think. You realize there's nobody that can make you think something you don't want to think? No how, no way, I don't care what they put you under. They cannot make you think something you do not wish to think. Viktor Frankl, I believe, is his name, right? He's a psychiatrist that was in the German concentration camp, and he is quoted as saying, no matter what they put me through, they could not make me think something I didn't want to think. 
Napoleon Hill says in Think and Grow Rich, it's the one thing you and I have absolute control over is what we choose to think about. He also says that's not meant to be a statement that we actually exercise that control because in the majority of instances, we don't. We don't exercise the control of thought and that's why we end up in areas we don't wanna be. But we have a conscious thought and that thought causes a feeling. Do you have any grandbabies? Look, at, did you see her face change? Did you see that? As soon as she thought of grandbabies, you got a feeling, didn't you? And the feeling. See, it's the feeling that's expressed in actions. It's not the thought. That's why Napoleon Hill in the, in the book Think and Grow Rich, he's teaching us to think. And then we can grow rich in all areas of life. See, it's the action that produces the result, and it's the feeling that spurs the action. That started to make sense about why I kept getting the same results, even though I thought I was behaving differently. No, I really wasn't. The feeling was in charge of the action, not the conscious thought. When you really wrap your mind around that, go home and play with it. You're going to realize how, how valid it is. Your feelings are in charge of all of your actions and all of your results, not your conscious thought, not at all. If you, if you wish to enhance the result in any area of your life, what do you have to do? Enhance the quality of your thoughts. That's all. It's not hard, is it? It is until you do it a little bit every day. Every day, just a little bit. I didn't read this. I haven't read this book. You know, I don't even read a chapter a day. Mr. Lyndon will tell you, sometimes I'll read the same paragraph for 30 days. The same paragraph. What does he mean by that? And when you grasp the meaning, remember, he studied some really wealthy people. You know, this guy named uh, Wrigley, he did, he did okay, didn't he? Yeah, chewing gum, what an empire. You ever heard of a guy named Truett Cathy? You ever heard of Chick-fil-A? Guess what book he endorses? This one. So this book is there and it's teaching us how to think so we can then grow rich. But it's the thought that comes first because the thought creates the feeling. The feeling is expressed in the action. It's not the action that comes first, it's the thought that comes first, which creates the feeling. Without the feeling, you won't get the action. See how simple it is? It's not hard when you tie it all together. Now to actually pull it off is not the easiest thing. That's repetitive, that's what that is. But this book has absolutely changed the direction of my life. And what you just saw, that stick person, that has done so much in my life. So I, to understand what Napoleon Hill is talking about, I literally have that thing on the wall in my office, right behind my desk. It reminds me to think before I do things. It reminds me to use the mind that God has given me, if I can use that word here. But that's what it does. That's what it reminds me to do. See, we've been endowed with a thing called a mind. There's not another creation on this planet that we're aware of that has mind. But you go find a horse, a pig, or a cow, and they have a brain. They have eyes. They have ears. They have nostrils, veins, heart, arteries, cartilage, hair. But they don't have mind. Only we do. So let's learn to use our mind and think and grow rich into the life we wish to grow into. That's the whole point we have. One of the whole points we have tonight. What we want to do for the rest of this evening is just share with you an overview of certain principles that Napoleon pulled together through all his years of research. And I'm going to kind of start this off a little bit, but we're going to tag team the rest of the night. And what I want to do is I want to play off of Tim's knowledge, the years and years that he's put into studying this book. We're going to share with you some anecdotes. We're going to share with you some stories, stories from the book, stories, real life stories that we both are aware of. But the key here is we want you to get a basic understanding of the power of these 13 principles and what they can do in your life. And again, our hope is nothing more that when you leave here tonight, you'll want to read this book because it will change your life. Absolutely. So let's just start. The very first chapter, actually it's chapter two mm -hmm. in 1937, the original version, 1937, chapter one's the introduction. In the introduction, what Napoleon does is he just tells a couple of really, really interesting stories. Yeah. Guys like Edwin Barnes. You guys know Edwin Barnes? Edwin Barnes became the partner of, of uh, Thomas Edison. Tim may share that story with you here in a minute. Talks about a guy named R.U. Darby. R.U. Darby's a real interesting guy. He had an uncle that decided to go out and do the coal, the, basically was in the gold, the gold rush out west. Uncle went out and found the gold main, comes back, 
raises money, grabs his nephew, are you Darby? And together they went out to go find this gold mine. They start digging. They're, start, they're this close to really hitting it big and paying off all their debts and really starting to make a profit. Guess what happened to the gold mine? It dried up. Now, after digging and digging and digging, they finally says, you know, we give up. So they sold their stuff to a junk man. <laughs> the junk man was smart enough to know that I'm going to get a geologist. I'm going to figure out what's going on here. Brought a geologist in, studied it, recognized there was a fault line. The geologist said, three feet here, you'll find your gold. Guess what they found three feet away? The shaft of gold. Amen. The junk man became a very wealthy man because he understood think Absolutely. now are you darby took this story and used it other times he became one of the wealthiest insurance salesmen mm -hmm. in the world yeah. he learned a lesson from the first mistake and never let it happen to him again there's more stories about are you mm -hmm. darby in the book as well absolutely but the fact thing is what we got to understand and this is where chapter two desire comes in you just got to know what you want life is about knowing what it is that you want mm -hmm. How many people do you know go through life sleepwalking? <laughs> it's a term I affectionately use a lot <laughs> because does. people just show up for life every day. They don't have a passion. They just exist. Mm -hmm. When you just exist, you sleepwalk. But when you have a desire, a red hot burning desire, if you have a passion, how's life? It's exuberant. Yeah, man. When I found my passion back in the 1990s, it changed my life. Now, well, sure, I went through stages of sleepwalking while I was trying to figure out what it is that I really wanted to do, but I knew that I loved to teach. I just had to find out how I was going to teach. And when I met this guy in 2009, the pieces fell into, just they started falling into place. It's been amazing ever since. Desire is such an important process. So what do you want? What, I mean, truly, what do you want? Not, do, not what do you think you can have, what do you want? And that may tell you, you may have to spend some time with a pen and a pair and, and, and you know, a, a writing instrument and a blank piece of paper. What do you want? Because you can have it. Yes, please. Can we get, hang on, let's get a microphone. See, I see, I paid attention. I behaved. That's a shock. That, I behaved, That's man. a shock. I don't behave very often. <laughs> Mm -hmm. After you do that, you usually have to figure out how to do that and make a living at it. Ah, that's where, that's where all the logic gets in the way. That's where all the logic gets in the way. Oh, what, what she said? Well, what did she say? You want me to repeat what she said? I know how to answer the question. I felt the energy, man. But that's where the, the, how, the how doesn't matter. Let me ask you a question. Did the Wright brothers know how they were going to fly? No. They had no idea how. Henry Ford, his engineers, this is no joke. You can study Henry Ford, his engineers, the really smart people that went to school told him the V8 motor was absolutely impossible. It'll never be done. We have V8s, V12s, V6s, V whatever. We have motors with, we have motors the size of this room. But his engineers told him it couldn't be done. It's one of the things that hangs us up, it truly does, is we have to know the how. How, how, the how doesn't matter. Do you want it? Now, your mind right now, I can see it. I can see it in your eyes. I am really confusing your mind. I get it. Because you're, and don't, don't take this wrong way, but you've got an analytic degree in your personality that has to know the how. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mr. Lindemann's got a degree of analytics. I don't have much. And that's okay. That's why we work so well together. This man is such a blessing in my life because he has parts of his personality and drives that I don't have. And, but the how, I promise you, will get in your way. One of the exercises we go through in one of the big programs we have called Thinking Into Results, the first thing you do is you go through a hole, let go, just let that pen fly, man, let it fly. What do you want? Let it fly, don't worry about the how. Don't worry about it, just let it fly. When you were playing in the sandbox, you didn't worry about the how, did you? Nope, nobody does. And there's six real simple steps. It's in the book, six steps. First, what do you want? Step two, what are you willing to give in return for what you want? Because we have way too many people in our society that sit in front of an empty fireplace demanding that fireplace give them heat. 
the fireplace is looking back going, hey, hey, give me some wood, I'll give you some heat. In other words, you have to give first, right? First law of receiving is what? Giving. So what are you giving in return? Okay. Step three, establish a date. When do you want it by? See, all this doesn't make any sense. It's not logical. It's not like, when do you want it by? Step four, create a definite plan and begin at once whether you're ready or not. There's the key. Begin at once whether you're ready or not. Why ready or not? Why ready or not? Because you'll procrastinate. That's why you have a date. What else happens when you start whether you're ready or not? Pardon me? What else happens when you start whether you're ready oh, or you, not? Oh, then the rest of the plan starts to show itself. So yeah, do you, ever, do you ever drive at night? Yeah, yeah. So, but your headlights only go out about 200 feet. What do you do? Stop and say, I'm not going any further until it shows me the whole way. I need to know how that road goes. You don't do that, do you? You don't. See, when, when, once you go, the headlights stay out ahead of you, don't they? The same will happen with your plan. That's the point Mr. Lindemann wants to make. Your plan will show up as you move. Everybody, if you were sitting around waiting for the perfect plan, <laughs> you're not going to do anything. You're going to wear out the chair. Does that make sense? That's, uh, so a definite plan, not a perfect plan. And begin at once whether you're ready or not. Now here's step five and step six is where the rubber meets the road. Step five, Napoleon says, write, uh, write out a clear, concise statement of steps one through four. I'm going to elaborate on that. I'm going to ask you to write a story. What's it look like when it's done? Start your story with something along the lines of, I'm so happy and grateful. Now that. Now that means it's present tense. You, can, you realize you can trick your subconscious mind into believing you already have something you don't have. Exactly. So if you write the story and write it the way you want it with all the glory and glamour, put it in there. Don't worry about what your neighbors think. They're not paying your MasterCard bill anyway. And then step six, read that story out loud at least twice a day, once before you go to bed and as soon as you wake up. And as you read, see, feel, and believe yourself already in possession of what you want. Now, my mentor played a little trick on me. We don't have any youth in here. Uh, we might have youth there. Okay, played a little trick on me, guys. But go to school, finish school. Okay, all of you. No students here. Go to school. But he played a little trick on me. He, taught, he told me that I had a benefit and an advantage because I quit school. I said, oh, yeah, you want to explain that one? Because corporate America doesn't want me. I couldn't get a job that he got. I can't get a job in the companies that he was at today. I don't have a degree. I can't get a job there, but it's really cool. They pay us a lot of money to teach them this stuff. But they won't give me a job. <sighs> but he said, you have an advantage. You didn't learn all those extra years. You have to work for somebody else. You can now work for yourself. Start at the top and build the bottom, and I'll show you how. I said, take me by the hand. <laughs> but that was a desire that I had. I, I truly, a desire, what do you want? Let me, let me elaborate. I said, I'm looking at the time. Let me elaborate. I got one story that's personal, and it's right here local. You can look this up. It's our, da it's our daughter. And she desired to play college soccer so badly that she endured four and a half years of rehab on knee after knee after knee after knee injury. And she got, no, this is no exaggeration, folks. You can look it up. I, I can prove this through documentation. She got a four-year scholarship to play soccer from a coach who'd never seen her play soccer. Where's the how? Doesn't matter. When, we, when she met the coach, she was on crutches. This is no exaggeration. How does that happen? It's not logical. It's passion, that's right. A couple of weeks before the college coach actually called us, um, her, my sister, her aunt, asked her, well, honey, how are you going to play ball in college? I mean, she's truly, she's got railroad tracks on both knees. She's blew both ACLs, right, lateral tear of the meniscus, rolled the meniscus over, for four and a half years of rehab. And he wanted her to play ball. And she's at college now. She has a game tonight. I'm here. That's how much this material means to me, to share this material throughout the world. I know she's playing ball. She's fine. Her knees are bionic. Jesus, Peach, you ever heard of a guy named Dr. Timothy Kremchek? Yeah, have you heard of him? He's kind of good at what he does. Yeah, he was her surgeon four times. 
So she's okay. So what do you desire? What do you desire that badly that you can attract into your life an opportunity to play ball and a coach never sees you play? Because if you want it that badly, it'll find you just like that coach found Rachel. Rachel never looked for college to play at. The coach called us. And if I were worried about the how, honey, I'd have to come sit down because it just boggles my mind. It doesn't work that way. College coaches don't give scholarships unless they see kids play ball. True or false? False. False. That's right. <laughs> That's my partner, man. False but it doesn't make any sense and it's not logical. Yeah. yeah. What if it's not a thing you want? Can you wait for the microphone, please? I didn't behave that time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't behave. I'm trying to figure out the difference between desire or what you want and what your purpose is. Ah. Because it's very different. It is very and different. I that I care so much about what I want versus I want to know what my purpose is. You want to, you, so you want to discover your purpose. Yeah. When you do yeah, that, it'll be a magical a moment. Yeah. It's not a tangible. You can't hold on to it. No. Because I, I can only yeah. tell you mine and I discovered it. And my purpose is to help another human being become more than they would have become without my influence through the teaching of this material. And I get up every morning to do that. That drives me. That's a purpose. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, what do I want to do with that? Well, I desire to earn a hundred grand a month, just me. And if I'm earning a hundred grand a month, I got to pay him a hundred grand a month because he wants a hundred grand a month. And it's not a hundred grand a month just so we can be selfish. It's a hundred grand a month. How much, how good can we do with that? How many people around the world can we have an impact on? See, there's a desire for that financial reward, but we know that can't happen without service first. Giving always comes first. So when you discover your true purpose, you won't even, it, you, it won't be a question. You'll know immediately, but you don't have to have your true purpose to have a desire. You don't have to have your true purpose to have a desire. No, you really don't. Well, you're talking about, you're talking about, let me ask you a question. How much would you like to earn? I'm going to go, I'm, let, let's go find it. It doesn't motivate you in any way, shape or form. Okay. No. So what would you like to do? If that, no, nothing, get, get, uh, get out of the parameter of what you're in right now mentally, yeah. which means whatever obligations you have, whatever's yeah. sticking you right here, get away mm -hmm. from that yeah. and let your mind go. Mm -hmm. What do you want to do? I'd like to do that. I'd like to be able to get rid of all of the things that keep me from doing. Well, just said that the, uh, the heck with them. They're gone. No, no they're gone. <laughs> they're no, no, no. Come on. Come on. Work with me. You can take your mind to, to this place. If you work with me, I'll take yeah. you there. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll just leave it here. Okay. Now, what do you really want to do? I don't know. You don't know. I don't That's know. okay. Yeah. That's okay. Because I wanted to fit my purpose. So I don't know. That's it. okay. So I keep it there. But that's okay. Yeah. Now allow it to be okay and you'll yeah. start to discover it through study. Hmm. Through repetition of study. I wouldn't know that book at all if I didn't read it every day. Yeah. It took 19 years to find one sentence in that book that completely changed the way I study the book. 19 years. I can go straight to the sentence right now. You can come on Thursday nights. We're going to invite all of you to Thursday night webinar. We go through the book. We tear it apart, rip it apart, rip each chapter down so you understand it better. Absolutely no charge for you guys. So if you want to learn more about it, but it's through the repetitive study that you'll discover it. It was through a massive repetitive study that I discovered mine. He's discovered his. It's real similar, just a little couple of words that are different, but he wants to help people become a better version of themselves. And his one, basically that's the same thing. That's why we work so well together, even though we are opposites. You want yin and yang, yin and yang, yang and yang, man. And that's the uh, truth. That's the truth. And if we didn't understand this material, we would drive each other batty. Absolutely. We would. We'd, we'd, we'd drive each other nuts, man. Does that make sense? Cool. As long as it makes sense. You know, going back to your, just one little additive thing. I found my why through study. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was manager of the company. I told you guys that's what I, I became manager. I was really bad at it, so I had to be good at it. So I started to study. What I found is that when I was studying, it made no sense to keep it to myself. So I started to share as I shared, I found that people were interested. Now, again, I found that there were right ways to share and wrong ways to share. 
but when I share the right way, which is more really just sharing, hey, I, I read this, it's kind of cool. When you preach, people kind of get, you know, mm -hmm. they get turned off by you, but when you share, just start a conversation, it was amazing how receptive people were to it. And through the sharing, I found that there was connections happening with relationships that I had at home and at work. And I found over time that my passion was teaching. But I only would have known that through the fact that I studied mm -hmm. and the realization I couldn't keep it to myself. Best way you're ever going to find your passion, you got to go do stuff. You can't go home at night, sit on the couch, and watch uh, the Big Bang Theory and never pick you, uh, oh, to figure it out. You got to go out and you got to experience it with people. Our, pur our purpose is always caught up in some way, shape, or form in relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right, moving on. One of the things that's next, and this is really, you, you, I'm sure you've all heard the saying anything the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. Anything the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. Well, that's really what chapter three is all about it's having faith. It is the critical component because we all have wishes, but if we don't believe, it'll be nothing more than a wish. That's right. So this is an absolutely, again, give your insights on the faith because this chapter is a, someone will make a break, right? It, it, it absolutely is. And, you know, faith acts as a magnet. It's absolutely the head chemist of the mind. If you want to go into a chemistry mindset for a minute for, for our, our, our analytic friends, our left brain friends, it's the head chemist of the mind. Now, it can be induced. Faith can be induced and created through the principle of self-suggestion and auto-suggestion. I can prove that. Let me prove that. What's seven times seven? When's the last time you were in math class? Could it, would it be accurate to say it was longer than a decade? Okay, cool. <clears throat> so if somebody were to walk in and you highly respect this person, and they know numbers very well, and they told you you were wrong, that seven times seven is not 49, would you doubt yourself? You would, you would doubt them, but you wouldn't doubt yourself. So in other words, you have a million percent faith that you have the right answer. Faith is nothing more than certainty. If you really want to think about it that way, that's all it is, it's certainty. You're certain about something, right? So how'd you get that much faith in that answer? Repetition of study. Five days a week, nine months a year, 12 years, plus college, plus all your life, you're working with numbers. So it's repetitive over and over and over and over again. How do you develop faith in yourself? Positive affirmation over and over and over and over and over again. That's the only way. There is no other way to create faith where faith does not already exist. Now, we're not talking about religious faith. It's a totally different type of faith we're talking about there. We're talking about building faith in you, building faith in what you want to do. That desire you have, repetitive over and over again, man. You can do it. I don't care what it is. You can do it if you desire it that badly. If Rachel can get a scholarship champ, you can do anything. Because that makes no logical sense. None. None at all, please. In, in Napoleon's connotation, faith is really nothing more than confidence. <clears throat> Belief, confidence that you can it's yeah. doable, it's achievable, right? That's the power of it. Yeah. Well, Napoleon and the wisdom and the way he wrote this book, right? We have belief or we have desire, we want something. We know we have to have faith in our ability to achieve it, but do we all have faith in ourselves? No, we don't. Again, this is where sometimes society wants to be this drag on us, right? It keeps pulling us backwards. But Napoleon was smart enough to be all these people he interviewed he recognized what made them different. Well, they figured out how to not listen to everybody else and to figure it out for themselves. And it was a very simple concept they call auto-suggestion, or as we call it, self-suggestion. Self Absolutely. Self-suggestion really is how you talk to yourself about yourself, and we do that all the time. Every waking hour, every waking moment, you are talking to yourself. Whether you're consciously aware of that or not, doesn't matter. You're constantly talking to yourself. It never stops. So what we want to help with is become aware of what are we thinking about? How are we talking to ourselves? Is it positive? Now, I'm not talking conceit, but you really should love yourself. Would you agree? Yeah, you should. It's not conceit. It's a healthy respect for who you are, what you stand for, what you believe in. How could you promote it if you don't have that 
within you, right? The way to develop that is through the principle of self-suggestion. And really, step number six in the six steps, if you remember step six, that is self-suggestion. That's what that is. And if a couple of times a day doesn't do it, do it 100 times a day. Oh, my gosh. I can't, I'll never forget the first time uh, Bob Proctor told us to read that thing 100 times a day. I went, 100 times a day? I said, absolutely, if that's what it takes. Because until you create the feeling, it's just a behavior shift. You don't have permanent change until you change the feeling. Think about it. How many people go on a diet? They change the behavior short term. What happens? We know the statistics. American Medical Association says that people that just diet gain it all back plus some. That's what they say. Not some of my words. That's their words. Why? They didn't change the feeling they had about themselves. They didn't go in here and change anything. They changed a quick behavior. They went to the gym for a couple of weeks, dropped a few pounds, dress size or two, or guys, a pants size or two. And we go on with life and what do we do? Right back to the same old, same old. Through positive self-suggestion, you can stop that cycle. I'm not saying I'm perfect at this, but by any stretch of the imagination, even after 22 years, I've got a long way to go and a lot to learn. But I'm a heck of a lot further than I was 22 years ago. The reality is for most of us, life is somewhat of a reprogramming. Mm -hmm. you know, we all grow up and are conditioned to think in certain ways based on our parents, the communities we went to, we lived in, the schools that we went to, all those conditioned us to think in certain ways. Maybe conservative politics or liberal politics. It may be how healthy you are, whether you exercise or don't exercise. Again, we're all programmed. The challenges we have is depending on the program, sometimes we got a lot of reprogramming to do to become who we want to become. Napoleon understood that. That's what made the 500 people different. Mm -hmm. They knew how to reprogram themselves through auto-suggestion yes. or self-suggestion. Mm -hmm. There's a simple concept, and I wish Jim and I had the time. It's a concept called paradigms. Oh, man. It is the most man. powerful thing that we don't know, we, most people don't understand. Mm -mm. It is the programming that we have. We all know things we should do in our lives, but we don't do them, right? It's because you're a paradigm. Mm -hmm. It's a hidden program running in autopilot in the back of your mind, in your subconscious. The only way to reprogram it is through auto-suggestion, self-suggestion. Mm -hmm. You have to convince yourself differently than how you were originally programmed. We could spend hours on that topic alone. Mm. We could. Got lots of, lots of PowerPoint slides for that one. Absolutely. <laughs> but again, these first three chapters are the make or break. If you can master these three principles, you can be successful in life. Mm -hmm. It really is that simple. Okay? Moving on. The fourth principle that Napoleon wanted us to talk about is called specialized knowledge. Very, very important concept because people, general knowledge, who, who will pay a lot of money for just general wisdom? Not much. But again, you get PhDs in chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. Do they make a lot of money? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Specialized knowledge. Now, the key here is each of us don't have to possess the specialized knowledge ourselves. It's the period. But we need to know how to get it and mm -hmm. use it and plan it and share it so we can get paid for it. It's in mastering the skills of specialized knowledge that makes or breaks what we do. Absolutely. Um, Andrew Carnegie was the wealthiest man in the world in 1908 in the steel industry. That's a fact. It's also a fact that he knew nothing about the technical end of the manufacturing of steel and he knew nothing about marketing steel. That's a fact. He surrounded himself with 52 people that knew how to do everything he didn't know how to do. He didn't have to know how. How many of us were taught to be the jack of all trades and master of none? We've all heard that one. Your, your faces tell me that. It doesn't work in our society anymore. What specialties? Think of Dr. Kremchak. What specialties? Orthopedic surgery. That's it. I can promise you I was in that office a lot. I never saw him filling out a chart that he didn't do that. So that's what he's talking about in here. What do you want to specialize at? What do you want to get really good at? Even with Kremchak? Yeah. He does knees. Oh, yeah. He doesn't do elbows. He doesn't do shoulders. He doesn't do anything else. He does, he knees. does knees. That's it. That's all he does. Specialized knowledge. I don't, I promise, I don't know how to do much of other than what I'm doing right now. He'll attest to that. 
I can build a PowerPoint. I can put some slides together. I can do that because that's I, I enjoy doing that. But this is uh, pretty much all I do, and te teach people. That's what I do. I won't do anything else. So hire somebody else to do everything else, and then we can serve more people, right? But if I try to do all of that plus this, and I mess up all of that, then I got to spend more time back here. Then I'm not doing what I really like to do. Think about it. It's a vicious cycle we get into. It really is. The fifth principle for thinking grow rich is imagination. Now, Tim tells an amazing story about chocolate that I think is worth sharing. I'll like tell this story here in a second. But the power of our imagination, yeah. it's really the fourth most critical skill. I mean, before we, that saying I said earlier, anything the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. Mm -hmm. Well, what's conceiving but using your imagination? You have to see the outcome, right? Before you ever produce the outcome. One of our mentors, a guy named Bob Proctor says, if you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hand. But you first gotta see it in your mind. Mm -hmm. Tell the chocolate story. Sure. There's, uh, do you have a grandson, daughter? All girls. All girls, I have two daughters. Yes. They're past teenage now, and yeah, you can feel sorry for me. It's okay. <laughs> How old are they? To 13. So you have one around three years old? I have a three-year-old. You have a three-year-old. And then the name would be her name is? Caitlin. Caitlin. Okay, cool. So you go home this evening. I want you to work with me on your imagination. So she goes home this evening, and you get there, and Caitlin is sitting on a stool, and she's doing this. Mm, oh boy, that's good. And you look down, and you see there's nothing there but carpet. Oh, Caitlin, hi, honey. What are you doing? Oh, hi, Grandma. I'm having some chocolate from the chocolate stream. You want a bite? What might you do? Uh-huh. Your personality trait, you probably take a bite, maybe even sit down next to her and start doing it too. Play yeah, play the game, man. Cool. Now, I want you to think about when you arrived here this evening. You got here this evening, and I'm sitting out there on that curb. And I'm doing this. Oh, man, that is some tasty stuff. And you walk by, um, sir, you okay? Well, absolutely, I'm okay. Can't you see? I'm just having some chocolate from the chocolate stream. You want a bite? What might you think of me? Crazy straight jacket, 911, right? Yeah, how many of you have a smartphone? How many of your smartphones were created by a three year old? Uh, you all just fell right into that one for me, didn't you? See, it's an adult using their imagination. It created the smartphone, it created the internet, it created our ability to hang this thing, this camera from a pole, and it's going out anywhere in the world. It wasn't a three-year-old's imagination, so here's my question. Why do we praise the imagination in a child and belittle that imagination in an adult? Why do we do that? I got you to stop and think, didn't I? Don't belittle the imagination. Get it out of the closet, folks. You all have one. It's the greatest gift. It's the most powerful force on this planet, hands down. Somebody's imagination came up with an idea of landing somebody on the moon and bringing them back safely. That was just one idea from one person. And look what we created with it. So get your imagination out. Dust it off. Have some fun with the chocolate. Y'all will never forget that one, will you? You know, the imagination is so powerful. I bet that each of you can close your eyes and think of a chocolate bar just in your mind with your eyes closed and you'll actually taste chocolate in Absolutely. your mouth. Absolutely. That's how powerful our imagination is. Mm -hmm. But yet when it comes to our imagination, who do we usually hurt the most when they share an imaginative thought? People that are closest to us. You know, Napoleon says in the book, Think and Grow Rich, very closely. Be careful what you say to people mm -hmm. because you're either planting the seed of success or the, or the fear of failure by just the simple words that we say in response mm -hmm. to a comment that they make. Yeah. Now, we'll just say we're trying to be rational. We're trying to be realistic. <laughs> realistic. What the heck is realistic? Somebody what's tell me, realism? What's oh, normal? I'm sorry, go ahead. Can somebody tell me what, what's normal? You don't even have an answer for that one? It's the setting on a dryer. 
I apologize. Oh, no <laughs> this is what I got to put up with all the time. Come on. <laughs> the, the thing here, right? Our paradigms are what we use. To... But does that mean our paradigm's right? The reality is it's not. It's just different. Not right or wrong, it's just different. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important to understand these concepts. We talked a lot, there's different types of imagination. Synthetic and creative, and we don't really have a ton of time to go into the difference. Synthetic imagination is what we usually use, the majority of us, all the time. All we do is rearrange old concepts and ideas. We're doing that with Think and Grow Rich. We're doing that with seminars that we build, just rearranging it. That's all we're doing. That's what most of us use. We get into creative imagination when we get to the sixth sense. Okay. The next chapter, this is honestly, this is the longest. <sighs> In some ways, it's the driest <laughs> of the chapters, but it also is one of the most impactful chapters because yeah. there's some amazing concepts in a chapter on organized planning. Mm -hmm. uh, concepts like the QQQ principle. It's, what Napoleon says is, if you just understand three simple concepts, are you always doing the best that you can do? Quality. Are you always doing the most that you can do? Quantity. Are you always doing it with a spirit of goodness? of caring, spirit. When you apply the QQS principle, you can't go wrong. Mm -mm. You know, it's funny, I was in mechanical contracting, heating and air conditioning business for 30 years. I had technicians were off the charts good technically, but they always weren't the best communicators. The guys that my, the customers we had wanted were the guys who could talk to them. They weren't the guys that were the most technically sound, but they just knew they could communicate and tell them what was going on. That spirit is what makes such a difference in our lives. The other thing in the, Q, or the, 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 <laughs> in the chapter of organized planning is he does a lot of self-analysis. It's the chapter mm. where he asks you to take some real introspection into who you are and what you can do to become better. Yeah. It's, a very, it's one of those chapters, you got to do it slow. Take your time. But it's powerful, powerful concepts, right? It's it, without question one of the. It's the longest. It's it's if you look at it from a study perspective, it, you might even say it's the hardest. But it's also the most eye-opening. It truly is. So an organized. If you don't, if you think about organized, an organized capital. It's the way they think and grow rich. We get on money, right? Okay. Think of what it costs you to go out and stick this little nozzle in your car, pull the trigger, and you get a gallon of gasoline. A couple few bucks, right? How many billions of dollars in organized capital were required to bring that gasoline to that pump so you could just do this? See, if you stop and think about that, you know, you go, oh, shoot, I'm never going to complain about the price of gasoline again. Yeah, you want to drill your own well, have your own boats, and think about your own refineries and stuff like that. He's, he talks about the organized capital and how it's so important for us to do what we do in our life. So we get away from this negative thought process of expensive. Where did that come from? The 30s, we're not in the 30s anymore, right? That organized is so important because without organized capital, think what it might cost you for a gallon of gasoline. Yeah, and then this chapter, oh man. The next chapter is just about <laughs> the ability to make a decision. Want me you to want recite this? In our lives, if you really want that, have that burning desire, does it involve making a choice? Does it involve making a decision? Yeah. Well, absolutely it does. We have to be able to choose. We have to make a choice. We have to decide, am I going to do this or am I going to do that? Mm -hmm. Decisions are an integral part of the whole process. Yeah, I mean, it is. Every, everything we do is a decision. You've made thousands of decisions today. Thousands of them. But how many of you had to make a decision to sign a document that could cost you your life? What about the Declaration of Independence? 56 men said, you know what? I'll sign that thing. Yeah, they were signing their own death warrant, folks. Now, we make tough decisions. What fast food restaurant am I going to eat at today? That's a tough one. But is that anything compared to the real tough decisions? To think about it. He starts the whole chapter off. He says this accurate analysis of over 25,000 men and women who had experienced failure disclosed the fact that lack of decision was near the head of the list of the 31 major causes of failure. He says this is no mere statement of a theory. It is a fact. Lack of decision. I didn't have the, uh, a track record of making quick, firm, definite decisions. 
So I want to help you with the way my first mentor helped me. Next time you go to a restaurant, don't look at the menu. You know what you want to eat. Just order it. That seems preposterous, doesn't it? See her body language there. She threw that energy right at me, man. I felt it. Don't worry. Why is that so preposterous? You know what you want. You don't need that menu. You know what? You'll freak waiters out and servers out, waiters and waitresses. You'll freak them out when you're that firm in your decision-making process. I don't need the menu. I know what I want. Huh? Have you ever been here before? No? Well, how do you know what we have? I'm, I don't care what you have. I know what I want. I freak them out. They really do. But it's a great way. That's how I started. That's truly what I, I did to start developing the habit of a quick, firm, definite decision. Go into a restaurant, order what you want. They'll make it. I promise they'll make it. They will. Go ahead. Oh, this one. Good gosh. Love it. Another very critical component in the steps to success mm. is the ability to be persistent in your efforts. Yeah. One of the things that's going to happen, you're going to have challenges. You're going to walk out. You're going to make decisions. You're going to go so far, there's going to be a wall. There's going to be a hurdle. There's going to be a challenge. There's going to be a paradigm wanting to pull you backwards. Mm. The only way to ever get what it is you want is you got to be persistent. You can't give up. You just got to want it badly. Two questions to ask yourself whenever you set a goal. Am I able and am I willing to do whatever it takes to achieve the results that I want? The second question is the most important. Mm -hmm. It's the one that most people end up saying, no, I don't want to work that hard. <laughs> but that's the one that makes a difference. Uh, my first mentor, my first mentor said this, stubborn is stupid, persistence is profitable. I didn't need to hear any more. And if you think about it, he's right. I mean, I, I'm stubborn. I can be stubborn and walk into that wall over there and just keep walking into that wall and keep walking into that wall. I'm stubborn. I, eventually I'll get to the outside. I might have a flat face and, you know, some blood on me, but I'll get there, right? That's stubborn. That's stupid. Especially when the door is right there. <laughs> Does that make sense? When he talks about persistence, one of the things he's talking about is to persistently apply these principles, persistently utilize auto suggestion, persistently know that you can think and control the thoughts. And that will keep you persistently moving in the direction of your goals. This man's been through some stuff. We won't, we won't go into it, but I know what he's been through because I'm his business partner, man. Persistently going forward, man. Go, go, go. We're not looking backwards. That's backwards. This is forward. That's yesterday. It doesn't matter anymore. What do we got going today and tomorrow? Makes sense, doesn't it? Absolutely. Again, oh. every one of these principles is powerful, but this is also yeah. one of the major keys to success, is recognizing you can't do it all by yourself. Napoleon understood the principle behind a mastermind group. Andrew Carnegie, 56 people that he worked together with mm -hmm. to create the steel industry that he created, the, the, the empire that he created. All of us need to recognize we need some strategic help in our life. Financial help, legal help, whatever it might be, right? You need to find the right people to bring onto your mastermind group to be able to achieve success in your life. Absolutely. And absolutely, it, it, honestly, until <laughs> Tim and I were trying to tackle the world by ourselves for years. Hang on a minute, I'm stubborn. Yeah, <laughs> me too. But finally, the light bulb went on about 12, 14 months, 18 months. Yeah, man. And I can't tell you just the difference it's made in our own business because we got out of our own way. way. And we teach this stuff. Yeah. You know, we get in our own way all the time. Absolutely. It's when we learn to get out of our way that we can yeah. really start achieving massive success. Absolutely, man. Anyone else? Absolutely. Add? Now, it's, you know, once again, Mr. Lindemann has skills I don't have. We met with a gentleman earlier today that took a look at what, what we do and what we have in real estate. He's got a list of over 2 million people, and he is a digital expert. Digital expert to me is you know how to turn the computer on. There's a little bit more to it, and it, it's without his. Oh, you don't know how to do what he does, do you? Mr. Moore, I don't know how to do what he does, but he's going to get us exposed to 2 million people on one list. I said, you go, dude. We got the content. See, most people, that's what they're telling us, that the people we talk to, we have a lot of content. We're content ready to teach and train. And they're telling us most people in our position, they have the ideas, they don't have the content. Our content's already written, it's already produced, it's already done. We're ready to go. 
but we don't know how to do it on the internet. I don't know how to do what, what she's doing back there on this computer and camera and everything. I have no idea. Hello, everybody. How you doing? But I don't want to know how to do either. I let somebody else do that. That's the mastermind. I know we're kind of starting to run a little low on time, so we're going to blow through the last Go couple ahead. of chapters. Yep. So. This is one of the most interesting <laughs> chapters in the book. And you get to this one, and you title. want me to speed up. The, transmute, the mystery of sex transmutation. Please. Get your mind away from that thought. <clears throat> you can read your energy. Has the power nothing. in this chapter is unbelievable. Absolutely. <laughs> Boy, did people see. For those of you in the audience, you should have seen the way people set up in the room. <clears throat> you got to see what they do in the full seminar on this chapter. The simplicity of this chapter, though, it's about managing creative energy. That's it. Period. It's all about it. managing creative energy. It's about finding the genius within and channeling it to produce the outcomes that you want to produce. Don't let the title of the chapter take you astray. It's worth reading, and it's worth Ooh. understanding. Napoleon gets into two very, very important. Tim talked about this a little bit earlier. The subconscious mind and the brain. Mm -hmm. These two chapters, two of the shortest chapters in the book, mm -hmm. but again, it's about understanding how important our subconscious mind is and why sometimes it's also our biggest enemy. Mm -hmm. The brain, it's the ability to be able to, I mean, we all, we believe in ESP or not, we're, we're just vibrating all day long, right? How many times have you thought about a friend or a family member, next thing you know, they're calling you? Guys, we're sending vibes out all day all long. All the time. Never stops. We're rippling and don't even realize how much we're rippling. That's right. Napoleon's trying to get us to understand why and how these concepts work. The sixth sense Ultimately, it's just about mastering creativity. Mm -hmm. Which I'd about a little bit of that real quick. Yeah, it's a, it, that's where creative imagination, the sixth sense, he, he says it's the, door to the, it's the door to the temple of wisdom is what he calls it. And it's the creative imagination. Now, I have to have a clear image on the screen in my mind or I'm confused. I'll just be honest. I'll, oh, shoot, that's everybody. That's right. So this creative imagination thing and the sixth sense if you read and study, they're telling us that's the pathway that ideas get into our intuition, which is one of the intellectual faculties of the mind. We didn't have time to go into all of that. So I had, okay, creative imagination into my intuition. Where does the ideas come from? Napoleon says infinite intelligence. He uses the word infinite intelligence. You can convert that, call it God if you want to. So I got this bucket up here, infinite intelligence, God. Hose coming down here. That's the creative imagination. What's down here? Intuition. Drop it in there for me. Thanks. Too simple? Now we can complicate the heck out of it if you want us to. But how simple is that? Where do your ideas come from? Ah, they started thinking again. You could see it in their eyes, man. But that's really the sixth sense. And what he talks about in the sixth sense and is how we can recondition the paradigm. We can, re we can recondition the conditioning. We're all conditioned to believe things. We're all conditioned to do things. In this chapter, he goes into in-depth detail about how to recondition it. That's what I had to do. Quit school in the eighth grade. The first year in real estate, I earned 139 grand. Second year, I earned 280 grand. Third year, I went over, I did 400 grand, and I did it on 30 hours a week. That's not logical. And corporate America doesn't want me. Except with him, to teach him. The last chapter in the book is about fear. It's about learning to master our fears. Oof. What keeps us from taking, uh, taking steps forward is generally some kind of fear. Mm -hmm. We can master it through self-suggestion and understanding the principles of persistence. You know, folks, it's truly a blessing for absolutely. us to be here with you. I do believe that this book really is a must read. It absolutely has principles that when you apply it will change your life. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, this book can change you for the better for the rest of your life, whatever that might be. Tim and I are truly blessed to be here with you tonight. We'll stick around for a little while after tonight's over. We, we love doing what we do. We have all kinds of programs. We talk about leadership. We do sales training. We have programs that we do specifically to think and grow rich. In fact, we're going to, if we can get a list of whoever's here, we do a free Thursday night web series, 14 weeks long on the book, Think and Grow Rich. Every Thursday night, 9 p.m. All of you are invited to join us to that. We just started a new series last week. So tomorrow or Thursday night, we're doing a chapter on desire. Any questions?
If you want to make sure we get your contact information, online. we'd love to have you join us again. Free to you, Absolutely. no charge. No charge. We do other programs that are a little bit more involved mm -hmm. about applying the principles, but again, if we can help you guys in any way, we're happy to do that. Absolutely. It is our passion. Absolutely. That said, thank you for allowing time. us to be here. Wow, I have to say I've been to uh, inspirational classes and motivational classes, and this is the best I've ever been to. Thank you, very thank much. you so much. We had 18 people online tonight. Great class. Thank you, thank you so much. And also, they donated the book for the giveaway tonight. So, if thank you so much. If in the coffee to take with them, we do have some books in the back. They're twenty dollars a book. You're welcome to buy one tonight if you want. Thank you. Thank you.